Hi, I'm Therese Svoboda, and I'm going to talk about fight scenes, in particular fight scenes for speculative fiction. Speculative fiction, like all fiction, often requires conflict. Even if it's just the dandelion and the cliff you can't quite reach in a short story about quasi-human moles, something is wanted, cannot be gotten, is worth fighting for. Often speculative fiction physicalizes conflict with swordplay or hand-to-hand -hand combat, if not the casting of powerful spells. Whether it's fighting with drones or cudgels, the same writing pitfalls will emerge. Writing a realistic fight scene is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Whether it's a short story, actually it's, it's like uh, writing a party scene, a lot of moving parts. Whether it's a short story or a novel, the first rule for fight writing and for writing any scene in general is to ensure that it moves the story forward. <clears throat> the easiest way to find out if the fight scene you've written moves the story forward, delete it. Then you read the scene before and the scene after, and if you can still make sense of what happened, then delete the fight scene permanently. The story hasn't progressed. The scene wasn't necessary. Starting your book or story in the middle of a battle is seriously risky. Without your reader knowing who any of the characters are or what the stakes are, there's no way to make them really care about what's happening. And caring is the name of the game. The impact of any battle scene depends on how much the reader cares about the individuals in it. Warring families, grud matches, vengeance, missions, and separated lovers, yes. The key to a great battle is in quantifying the events within it. The reader needs to know what's at stake, what's being lost, and what each specific event in the fight means for the overall outcome. If a city the reader has never visited is overrun, he'll find it hard to care about it. But if he knows what beautiful avenues are being destroyed or understands the city's tactical value to the protagonists, then he'll know more about what its loss means. Start with the goals of the protagonist and extrapolate moments that put those goals under threat. Why else is it so thrilling when the cavalry and all the horses arrive? Because you know what stakes are at that point in the story. Fight scenes are like, well, as I said, fight scenes are like writing parties, a lot of moving parts. Things happen quickly to a lot of people. Everyone is affected by a fight. And in real time, fight scenes can be repetitive, confusing, and exhausting to watch. The situation can be symphonic or total chaos. The Bayhem of the Transformer movies is a good, or should I say bad, example of a chaotic fight. Don't get lost yourself. Write timelines for each character. This will not only help you clarify events in your own mind, but might help identify any holes. If you want to convey chaos, you don't want to lose your reader as a result. Don't try to communicate the chaos of warfare head on, but have it happen to your characters. If you want to show the battle from different perspectives, split up your characters during the action or spread them throughout the battle scene before it starts. Keep the geography clear. It's especially important to know where everyone is, especially if there are fisticuffs or swords. Tracking your character's path through the battle will stop you and them from getting lost and missing out key details, which is especially essential if you're going to be jumping between different characters' perspectives. How should you track them? Since real battles are all about terrain, draw an actual map from your reference. Mentioning landmarks anchors the reader while the action swirls around. The tower seems to sprout out of the helmet of Lancelot, then the tower from the point of view of the downed Lancelot, and then, at last, the tower looms over him. Point of view. To organize a fight scene and have your reader follow it most easily, it's best to choose either first or third person close. Why? Well, because you have one set of eyes, one aching shoulder, one sweetheart you're hoping to see again. It simplifies your job. You can show the fight through a series of first-person encounters, but often too many angles on the same scene can be confusing and slow it down. The other possibility, an omniscient or bird's-eye POV, gives the battle scene a game-like quality. 
That works well for pointing out strategy in a few sentences, but it's hard to sustain. That means it's hard to keep your reader caring about the fight without a personal investment. So decide on your character and write in either first person or third person close as a single character against a force or one-on-one. -on -one. Battles re reveal a side of a character that nothing else will will force you to dig deeper into a character than you ever did before and raise the stakes in a story in a way that few other scenarios can. A single character fighting will be mobbed if she is fighting against many others and has to frantically adapt to survive. If this is the first one versus crowd fight your protagonist is in, you'll need to mention the chaos and panic of trying to keep track of multiple opponents. And if your protagonist is experienced in such a field, make sure your character's tone is calm and collected. Remember that she is likely to get tired over the course of the fight, so include this exhaustion as well. Here's a checklist for a single fighter. One, what does this ho character hope to gain or lose? Two, what sort of ability does he or she have? Three, what type of training does he or she have? Four, does this character have cultural beliefs about fighting? Consider that if you have no experience being in a fight, you'll react differently from a seasoned fighter. A professional fighter would most likely be very relaxed and focused. Good fighters can see a punch or a kick coming. They've had training and have been taught to focus on how the body moves in a fight. An inexperienced fighter will have a completely different experience. You might consider actually taking a fight class to understand the difference. You must also show the aftermath of a fight. Think about how the adrenaline rush of the fight helps your character recover or flee the scene. A character also bruises, aches, or just plain hurts. If he doesn't, you'll have to explain that superpower. Consider how your character will feel after a fight mentally too, anger, frustration, or elation. Give him a realistic recovery period. If he suffers a cut or stab wound, for example, you'll have to show his recovery. Or if you're jumping ahead in time, his scar from the wound. If a character has bruises or cuts to the face, this might limit his ability to eat or chew. If a character is in a fight for the very first time, he may feel shock and anxiety. Or PTSD. Or she may feel hardened and ready for more. While a movie allows a passive audience to have the action wash over them, fiction requires the audience to participate in constructing the fight scene from the writer's clues and seeing it play out in their imagination. That's a lot harder than getting it fed to you visually. In literature, fight scenes can slow the pace. That's because the reader has to reconstruct the scene in their mind using what details are sparingly provided. Reading a fight scene full of detail can get boring quickly, so use it as a way to explore your characters, your, your characters and provide more insight on these following points. One, <laughs> another series of numbers. Why does the character make the choices that he or she makes in the fight? Two, how does each choice reinforce their characterization? Three, how does each choice impact their internal or external goals? Four, is this conflict getting the character closer or further away from their, his or her goals, and how? Five, what are the stakes for each character? What do they stand to win or lose? I think I mentioned that earlier. What's the end result he or she needs from the battle? What does the outcome mean for the story? Remind the reader the goals each side is fighting for to heighten the tension. Six, what type of fighter is the character? Consider how fighting styles reflect the fighter's personalities. What are their physical or mental abilities? Remember once again that not every protagonist will be a trained assassin, so they'll be prone to make sloppy mistakes during the fight. You need to have creative uses of common superpowers as well as everyday items used in combat. And seven, it's also advisable to have a moment in which the character realizes something new about themselves because of the fight. In making a fight scene vivid, keep in mind the following. Accelerate the pace to fit the action. Shorter and simpler sentences are quick to understand and are best for a fight scene. 
If losing, the fighter may have interior character thoughts as she struggles to gain the upper hand. Come on, Buffy, focus. Avoid using too many dialogue tags as this can slow down the action. Although characters in a fight respond to each other primarily through action rather than speech, a little dialogue is a good thing. Don't focus too much on what's going on inside the character's mind. Introspection happens before and after a fight, but do share short verbal exchanges between characters. That helps to orient the reader as to where backup is or accentuates the concern between fighters with each other. Dialogue in an action scene is going to be staccato, short, rapid, and to the point. The characters are possibly breathless, under pressure. It's not time for poetry or soliloquizing. Underwrite. No long descriptions of what's happening or about the environment. Keep the descriptions of the scenery to a bare minimum. If the surroundings are intrinsic to the battle, set the scene before the start of the action. You know, long paragraphs about the darkness of the trees swaying overhead is distracting. Thinking about what the room or castle looks like that doesn't play a big part in the immediate physical situations um, it should be uh, done, as I said, before or after. Too much information will slow the action. Keep the fight short, too. Edit, edit, edit. Here's a quote from The Princess Bride, a, a famous fight scene. The cliffs were very close behind him now. Inago continued to retreat. The man in black continued advancing. Then Inago countered with a Thibault, and the man in black blocked it. Each sentence is short, the written equivalent of a sudden move. Every time a new person takes an action in this passage, Goldman, the author, starts a new line, making the reader encounter each attack as a sudden, vital event. Don't underestimate the power of breathing room between periods of action. These timeout periods are good to remind readers of the goals of the fight, in dialogue or signals between combatants. A slow buildup of tension, punctuated by short flurries of excitement, aims to lead to a big payoff. Keep the choreography as simple as possible. Direct your characters so the outcome you require is reached, but allow the reader to use his own imagination to fill in the more complicated steps. Write your character's actions as if he or she were a ninja. Little thought, just instinct. Looking more closely at the writing self, verbs, not adverbs. Adverbs are the opposite of action. The punch of a sentence comes with the character's action, its verb, not the adverb lagging behind it. She hit him hard is an exception, but you can't use that too often. Sensory information. Describe exactly what the characters are seeing and what the reader should pay attention to in the scene. Match the unfamiliar match the unfamiliar experience to a physical sensation the reader can recall. While not everyone has been held up by the collar, but everyone has heard fabric tear and tasted their own blood after an accident. Hearing uh, is a little more delicate. I don't think you should use kapow or bang, and be very sparing of the onomatopoeia, or it will sound cartoon-like. Taste? Sure, you could write, he could taste the fear in the air, but that's very abstract. Go for something more concrete, like blood, the texture of wheat bran, was not what he expected. The sense of touch, of course. He hit him like a delivery van taking a corner. Can you smell a fight? Well, sweat, of course. But what about burning rubber if there's screeching cars, or a garage nearby, or something incongruous, like lemon from someone's soap, or garlic on the breath? There are other ways you can show heightened conflict and danger in a story without actually writing fight after fight after fight, for example, a news report or gossip. Or consider the opposite of writing a fight scene. Skip the violence entirely and just suggest it. It depends whether you're trying to provide action or communicate violence, but for the latter, this can be incredibly effective. Just need the results of a, just, if you just use the results of a fight, uh, in conveying the conflict, it can be very, hmm. Of course, there are other ways you can show heightened conflict and danger in a story without actually writing fight after fight after fight. For example, news reports or gossip 
or consider the opposite of writing a fight scene. Skip the violence entirely and just suggest it. Here's a quote from um, Fight Club as an example. Two screens into my demo to Microsoft, I taste blood. My boss doesn't know the material, but he won't let me run the demo with a black eye and half my face swollen from the stitches in my cheek. In this case, the visceral nature of the missing scene is all the more powerful. Fear of injury is something everyone understands. Or take this description from Wells Tower's Viking Rampage in Everything Ravaged, Everything Burned. Our hands were stiff and raw from the row over, and we paused at a well in the center of the village to wet our palms and have a drink. We were surprised to see the kid with the thumbs in his belt burst forth from a stand of ash trees, yanking some poor half-dead citizen along behind him. He walked over to where we were standing and let his victim collapse in the dusty boulevard. This is nice, he said to us. You'd make good chieftains standing around like this, watching other people work. Why, you little turd, Hakon said, and backhanded the boy across the mouth. The fellow lying there in the dust looked up and chuckled. The boy flushed. He plucked a dagger from his hip scabbard and stabbed Hakon in the stomach. There was a still moment. Hakon gazed down at the ruby stain spreading across his tunic. He looked greatly vexed. As the young man realized what he'd done, his features fretted up like a child trying to pout his way out of a spanking. He was still looking that way when Hakon cleaved his head across the eyebrows in, with one crisp stroke. Hakon cleaned his sword and looked again at his stomach. Son of a bitch, he said, probing the wound with his pinky. It's deep. I believe I'm in a fix. Nonsense, said Goodnut. Just need to lay you down and stitch you up. Ori, Oral, who was soft-hearted, went over to the man the youngster had left. He propped him up against the well and gave him the bucket to sip at. <laughs> I'm not really espousing violence, but people, in order to get to some kind of an agreement, it often has to be dealt with. How and when you kill a character can make or break a novel. In the first place, it's incredibly difficult for authors, being a little like purposefully breaking one of your own creations. But when done right, a character's death can break a reader's heart. If done wrong, it'll just exhaust their patience. But why kill a character at all? Like a fight scene, if you kill a character and it doesn't make a difference to the story, eliminate the character. There are three possibilities for when to kill someone. For an emotional reaction, but the reader must know the character. In John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, the heartbreaking death occurs in the last few pages once we know and perhaps love the victim. A good rule of thumb for whether you've developed the character enough is your own reluctance to kill them. If you consider a character's death and hesitate because part of you wants to keep them around, then you've got a winner. The death should be wrenching for both the writer and the reader. It helps to remember that what feels like a loss to you will be doubly so for your readers, and that the immediate sacrifice will lead to a more enthralling and engaging story in the long run. If the purpose of the death is to establish a sense of danger, then a character can die on the first page. If death occurs frequently without warning, it establishes the vital theme that the characters are never safe. But the most important point is to write the death for the, for the character, not the character for the death. The character can't be in the story just to die. Readers will never invest in them and won't care once they're gone. When you kill a character, when you kill a character is strongly influenced by the purpose of their death. In Stephen King's Desperation, a father is killed out of nowhere, having survived most of the book and seemingly out of reach of the antagonist. The death is sudden and unexpected and serves the theme of horror through powerlessness and injustice. In Mordecai Rickler's Barney's version, the main character dies over the entire course of the book, leading the reader to focus on every moment of the life he wasted as the story unfolds in flashback. Consider the timing. Long deaths can be tedious or heartrending, sudden deaths shocking or laughable. The impact of a character's death stems from the ability of the reader to imagine how things would be if they had survived. Character deaths have impact when the reader feels a sense of loss, but for that sense to exist, 
the reader has to have a subconscious sense of what they've lost. Whether it's the character's behavior or the relevance of their relationships, something that it was desirable must now be gone. Less experienced writers often drop a love scene right before one of the lovers dies. The reader is meant to mourn the relationship that was cut short, never mind what they might feel, that they might feel just a little set up for the death. You can have a character thrown to certain death at the end of a chapter, and the next chapter starts with a daring last minute rec rescue. You can then detail how the enemies were defeated, how the relationships of all the characters progressed, and the idealistic scenarios that followed. Of course, the chapter is a lie, the fervent wish of the narrator, but its purpose is to create a highly realized picture of the world that should be. Readers then snap back to reality and are forced to confront the death with an aching nostalgia for what could have been. How else to tap into this powerful sense of regret that death evokes? Eulogy, a place in the story that references what's been lost directly through the death. It doesn't have to be a speech at the funeral or even sad. For example, uh, The Great Gatsby contains eulogizing passages before and after Gatsby's death, but the part that invites the reader's sadness the best comes before it happens. They're a rotten crowd, I shouted across the lawn. You're worth the whole damn bunch put together. I've always been glad I said that. It was the only compliment I ever gave him because I disapproved of him from beginning to end. The key to an impactful character death is to convince the reader that they've lost something, and annoying as that may be, it's almost impossible to fake that. I invite you to spend 15 minutes writing a fight scene from your current work, or just as an exercise, and uh, these, this should include the following elements. First, uh, employ fighting styles that reflect the fighter's personalities. Second. Creative uses of common superpowers or everyday items in combat. Have a moment in which the character realizes something new about themselves because of the fight. A poignant glimpse of what the character is fighting for. And a eulogy for that fighter. Thank you for your time and attention and good luck on your fight.